The People's Platform. Amanthi Harris was born in Sri Lanka and grew up in London. She studied fine art and has degrees in law and chemistry from Bristol University. Her novella Lantern Evening won the Gatehouse Press New Fictions Prize in 2016 and is published by Gatehouse Press. Her short stories have been published by Serpent's Tale and broadcast on BBC Radio 4 as afternoon readings. Amanthi's novel Beautiful Place is published by Salt Publishing in the UK and Pan Macmillan India in South Asia. Her story Red Sari is published in the textbook Context One and taught in schools in Sweden. Her story In the Mountains is published in Best British Stories 2020. My first guest this evening was uh, born in Sri Lanka, grew up in London and has degrees in law and chemistry. She's the author of Beautiful Place, a novel about losing home and making family, about being oppressed and seeking a better life. Good evening and welcome, Amanti Harris. Thank you, Sonali. Wonderful to have you with us here today. Amanti, um, Beautiful Place. Um, Speak to us first about the complexities you dealt with in terms of home and belonging. Um, um, I, I've read only a part of the book, um, but you, the, the concept of home is central mm. to, uh, to your um, theme, your body of work. Um, may I ask you to take us through the first part of the book? And okay. Accept, if you through the early morning house, Padma went out to the veranda. A breeze came in from the sea, easing in past the Aralia trees. Ever since returning to the villa, she'd had nightmares. In them, she was always a child, alone at night in the villa's garden, then propelled by an unseen force into a room. And it was the front room of the brothel down the lane, as she had seen it one time, when the black polythene over the windows flew up with the wind, plastic chairs pushed up against the walls, bottles of arak, beer in buckets of ice, and men. There were always men. In the dream, they crowded over her. She had woken up safe in her room at the villa, but the fear stayed real. Fear of the sheer randomness of her luck. For it was only luck, illogical, slight, unfathomable, that had lifted her to safety. Luck didn't make you feel lucky. Being saved didn't make you feel safe. A grey dawn lingered over the garden. Soon strangers would sit looking out at the sea, being at home in the villa, her world. The veranda was where all life at the villa flowed, to that view of changing waves out beyond the frangipani trees tangled around the front of the house. Already the room was altered. Three new tables for guests had replaced the long old pine table now stored in the shed. The room seemed bigger. Past the trees, the sun made a red gold rim over the sea. It burnished each ripple of the waves, drawing back from the beach, simmering, settling, stilling itself after the wildness of the night. A thin yellow streak spread across the sky, growing to amber, green, turquoise, becoming the blue to come. The bird's shrill waking cries faded, and the garden came to life, filling with the quiet new brightness of morning, the new day begun. It's so visceral, the imagery is so replete with richness. Mm. My question to you is, how do your laws in... Uh, sorry, my question to you is, how do your degrees in law and chemistry <laughs> feature? The truth is they don't. <laughs> Maybe they help me to be kind of disciplined about the writing process. Maybe all those years of studying and having to be organized. And I also worked briefly as a, as a lawyer. So um, all of that help, must help in some way for me in terms of organizing my work. And, um, but really, I think for me, the most helpful thing was um, quite later on in my education, I went to art college. And it was there that I started to really um, reflect on my childhood and to think about how I could capture it in some way. And 
um, I think that was where it all started. So I would say of all the different things I've done in terms of my education, those um, years at St. Martin's in London where I, I studied um, fine art was actually well, probably the most influential. Okay. And it's, it's where this st slowly started to happen. Okay. Do you think that uh, you see an intersection between uh, law, chemistry and the arts? There probably is um, an intersection. Um, I think for me it was more about I wasn't fully engaged with this, those subjects. You know, I enjoyed, sure. um, I'm fairly academic, I suppose, in the mm -hmm. sense that I can study and pass exams. But yeah. um, it, I, it was only when I went to art college that I was really inspired. And I think I'm somebody who needs to be inspired. Um, if I'm to really uh, get involved with something, I need to be inspired. That resonance. I, yes. And the excitement of finding out more. So, I mean, I can, I don't, I didn't ever really saw art as um, a, a burden or writing, never, you know, obviously I don't love the discipline that's required, but it's also a certain level of um, commitment that so, um, com comes so naturally when it's something you love. You uh, belong to the Sri Lankan diaspora, mm -hmm. and in Beautiful Place, you speak about the Sri Lankan diaspora. How do you ensure that you bring out the nuances, the, the complex emotions, um, what entails Sri Lankanness? Well, I think it's different for each person, and it depends on your own personal story and your own personal uh, family experience. And so um, I was very conscious of this kind of, uh, you could almost a kind of um, uh, a, gr a gradient of, of um, emotions and levels of uh, entanglement one fe felt with uh, the country, uh, this country that we all come from. And so I felt the best way was to have lots of different people, which is why a book where lots of people come and go and have different responses to the place um, was quite a good um, way of exploring it. So I've, I've got the whole range, you know, I've got the Gerhard, who's an expat, who's in love with Sri Lanka mm. and wants it to be his uh, place, and he's make, and, but he's making it in his own vision, you know, and he's, the villa is his little world and he's building his world. Um, Padma is from Sri Lanka, and she's, uh, but he, she's caught up in Gerhardt's vision herself. Um, of course, the people who come to stay, like Ria and Anjali, uh, Rohan, to some extent, they're all people who have had different experiences out in the West, and that's coloured their um, feelings in, in Sri Lanka. So uh, I use different characters and, and, with, and with their own personal, unique stories to explore their relationship to the country. Your characters grapple with identity in terms mm -hmm. of race, gender, nationality. And these complexities are also quite nuanced and also very human. We see these characters among us. Yes, that's wonderful because that's kind of what I wanted. I wanted people to sort of find, I mean, I read sometimes to to have myself mirrored back, you know, mm. to, to find consolation in, 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 in the experience of the writer or the, the, or the descriptions of experiences. And so I was hoping in a way that um, some you, people would feel a connection to these people. I felt extremely connected to the people because each one of them had a little part of me in some way. Something that I myself was grappling with went into each person. So um, it, for me it was an exercise, but also it was kind of, uh, I suppose you could argue, it was a kind of a, um, a giving as well for readers to take these elements and build the world that they um, saw themselves. I'd love to know your um, take on the concept of home. Is it a place? Is it a person? Um, oh. Is it a is it an abstract concept or a conception of mm -hmm. one? Um, given that in present day Sri Lanka, we have a mass exodus of people leaving the country, mm. seeking a better life. Mm. We also have the uh, Sri Lankans living overseas, dreaming of mm. having fancy, beautiful Sri Lankan holidays. Mm. So this sense of escapism, mm. this sense of um, interpretation of what is entailed by this concept of a home. It's so subjective. Mm. How do you view this? Because I live in Spain in a very um, sort of almost unreal um, place, which is up in the mountains and these little villages, where in fact um, people were exiled, so the Moors left Granada and moved up into the mountains and they lived up there. So um, it's, a, it's made me realize that home is a sort of um, a sense of community, really. Um, and I think 
um, this, I explored this in my first panel, actually. This is where we're talking about community and fiction. Mm -hmm. And similarly, um, the book is about a community and uh, that's been kind of they formed a community because they share values and they share an outlook and they share a certain sense of humor a certain uh sense of daring in a way and i think uh that's home really you know when you feel uh, a sense of connection with other people a really deep connection when you can be yourself mm -hmm. when you don't have to pretend to be someone you're not um and you don't have to um, be ashamed of your what you love and uh, so I think home is 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 such a place you know where you can uh, connect and 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 well obviously create you know for, for artists and writers and musicians if you can create you know there's always a way of making home increasingly we are seeing a disconnected dystopian world mm. what is the responsibility of the storyteller to bring people together I mean, I totally think storytelling, and especially oral storytelling, mm -hmm. which is a really, I mean, it's a different thing to the um, act of reading, because reading is such a private um, inter interior thing. But um, I used to run a project um, in um, the UK, uh, a storytelling project, bringing people together, uh, families together. And then it sort of grew and grew and became a, um, it was funded by the Arts Council and in involved grew it to adults as well and and it sort of became a writing project and all kinds of different manifestations but it all centered around oral storytelling and um, I was amazed at how much people loved it children and adults or you know and also telling stories so um, it wasn't just me telling a, an old tale or it was we also used to play this little game where we'd make up a story together and everybody would start off saying oh I'm no good at this and they would be amazing and um, yeah, so that's another way you build community. You know, I think storytelling, and we all then are bound by that act of sharing and uh, imagining together. And I think that is a very strong way forward to kind of to gather again in in storytelling circles. Oh, cool. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you very much for having me. Thank you. People's Platform. Education, an invaluable asset that can never be taken away from you. Laying the foundation stone for a new library building for the students of Nakia Denia Udagama, aiming to open new doors for a brighter future. Gamnatha, for the people, bye. The people. Bindu atau macam kecik siapa kerapu, samar deh pahlawan pelaya, ayo, kalau mana awak, ikut kalau mana tiro, ikut kalau, ini muka deh, kau muda ikut dia mana. Saru niu ilue, sistem change dek, dia ke uneh naya ni, dia ke hadang ni ni susu inu mana tiro, ayo ni sekejap naya kat teh, kau, arti kat kada beti, ni sanskuti kat kada beti, ni susu mana pasi apa kagai ni naya tak gan ni kini perasni tiro. Pak kari kari ni kat hari kini macam ni lah. कि यह करी हो आगे नहीं इन्द्र नाम पुरुषार्थ से है दिलाती नहीं जीवित है इतनी यहाँ पे आगे ह्यूमन लाइफ के क्या मन्नत नहीं नहीं तो प्लान कर अपुन जीवित है नेतृत्व लाने हम और टम्बर तमांगे जीवित है ही मिलने प्रजातंत्र वादे तारीख जत्र आ गया किया पावर्टी ऑफ डेमोक्रेसी बुद्धि में यह संवादी In support of Sri Lanka's unique tradition of art and design presents The Genius of the Place The Story of Jeffrey Baba A film by Abdel Aziz Exclusively aired in Sri Lanka on TV1 11th of February at 5.30 p.m. TV One, TV for Life. President calls for national unity to rebuild the country while inaugurating Urumaya. 
Anrakumar Desai Naik on official visit to India meets external affairs minister and holds talks on Sri Lanka's economic challenges. TISL slams outrageous passage of Online Safety Act. People cannot celebrate freedom when fundamental rights are violated, says opposition leader. Entire cabinet must be held responsible for the drug scam. National Civil Organisation Front stresses. Sri Lanka wins one-off test match against Afghanistan by 10 wickets. TV One, TV for life. The People's Platform. Join me this week on The People's Platform while I speak to some of the most phenomenal writers, both local and international, here in the historic city of Gaul at the Gaul Literary Festival. Kiran Millwood Hargrave was born in Surrey in 1990 and her earliest ambition was to be a cat closely followed by Cat Owner, or the first woman on Mars. She has achieved only one of these things, but discovered that being a writer lets you imagine whatever you want. She started writing poetry in her final year at university, producing three poetry books and a play before she turned to children's fiction. Her best-selling debut, The Girl of Ink and Stars, about a mapmaker's daughter who must save her island, won the Waterstone Children's Book Prize 2017 and the British Book Awards Children's Book of the Year. Her second standalone story, The Island at the End of Everything, was shortlisted for the Blue Peter Book Award and Costa Children's Book Award. Her third book, The Way Past Winter, was the Blackwell's Children's Book of the Year 2018. Her debut young adult's title, The Deathless Girls, was longlisted for the Divers Book Awards 2020 and shortlisted for the Young Adults Book Prize and the Foils Children's Book of the Year. Her first book for adults, The Mercies, was subject to a 13-way auction and debuted at number one on the Times bestseller chart and number five on the Sunday Times bestsellers list. Kiran lives in Oxford with her husband, artist Tom DeFreston, and the fulfillment of one of her earliest ambitions, the rescue cats, Luna and Mali. Good evening and welcome. My next guest is an award-winning novelist, playwright and poet. I'm so pleased to welcome uh, Kiran Millwood Hargrave. Good evening and welcome, Kiran. Hi, good evening. Kiran, fantasy, magic and love are some of your prominent themes uh, across your work. Speak to us about why this, these themes speak to you, especially in a world that increasingly appears to lack these very traits. Part of it is that we've forgotten how to connect with these mm -hmm. things rather than they've gone away. I think that necessarily we've consider ourselves ad advanced on, you know, when we when we move from being children to adults, we consider that we've grown when actually I think something of the reverse happens. I think we lose some of that wonder, that joy, that instant connection with everyday magic mm -hmm. that actually makes a lot of life worth living and for me in my books it's important to to latch onto these things not as sort of escapism or um, airy fairy uh, imaginings rather they're bringing us back to a more solid way of being and I think to live with love is one of the most brave things you can do and to still be open to the magic of the world is extraordinary to me and it's something children do so easily and I think we as adults should should get a bit better at it as well. Your writing is also replete with environmental themes uh, and nature. How powerful a, a role can literature play in creating awareness on environmental stewardship um, in the world, especially uh, giving this message to young readers? What's so important for young readers is 
alongside environmental themes is hope mm. because the news is quite understandably doom and gloom and we are passing on an inheritance to our children and I think it's important that they feel they have a stake in the world and that the world is going to be there when they grow up and the world is still so full of extraordinary things that they can explore but we need to make them understand they are part of nature they're not apart from it you know we as human beings are part of um, the ecological um, part of the world and so I think it's really important to connect children very young with that and not make us feel like it's hopeless because it's not if there's one thing I believe in more than human um, cruelty or cap capability for destruction it's in creativity and capacity for love so I think that's something we need to teach children. Uh, Kieran your book The Mercies delves into the historical context of the witch trials in 17th century Norway. Uh, speak to us about what the research process looked like and especially if you could um, take us through some of the most damning evidence you found through your research of the witch trials especially given the fact that the present-day world, although not directly referring to women as witches, um, we see the world over women being subjugated. In the 17th century, and I think as now, witch really became a byword for someone who was other, someone who was different. Mm. And this particularly manifested in women and women who sat outside the societal norms of the time. So women who were unmarried or who had particular color skin or marks on their body or a fondness for cats. There really was any excuse. Um, and I was really lucky to work with an extraordinary researcher called Dr. Liv Helen Willemsen, who is based in Norway, in Tromsø, in North Norway. And she actually translated all the witch trial manuscripts from Norwegian into English so I could understand them. Okay. And she rescued a lot of these women's testimonies, which, and to read directly the voice of a woman who lived so long ago and eventually went on to be murdered was incredibly powerful and moving and made me understand that this wasn't just fiction, this was historical fiction. This was fiction based on something that happened yeah. and women who actually lived and actually died. So it, it brought a gravity back. And I think the most damning bit of um, evidence I found was to do with the motivations for s behind some of the killings, which essentially were land grabs by the um, government at the time. They targeted, first they came for the poorer, less protected women, but then they went straight to the top. They went straight to the rich widows or women who were wealthy within their own right, and they'd possess their houses when they went to jail. And then once they were killed, the land was passed on to the state. Mm -hmm. So it was really quite confronting to see that People are so basic, <laughs> they just want more. They want more power, more money, more land, and that's been the same for centuries. And, and that hasn't changed. It hasn't changed, and I think a lot about why this is, because what I don't believe is that people are evil. I think people always, even if their motivations are incredibly twisted and the result of their actions is evil, I don't believe people are inherently bad. And they are always trying to do the right thing, even if their idea of the right thing is twisted. And so when I look at how women are persecuted now, I do think it still comes down a lot to fear. And I think it comes down a lot to people feeling like their way of being, their authority is being challenged in such a way that would be a detriment to the fabric of society. Mm -hmm. so I'm not justifying it. It's just, I think it's so interesting and important to understand what motivates people because then you can start to unpick it from the earliest because because again it's children that we need to talk to it's children who we need to um, come up with gender justice and gender equality and then throughout the generations I believe things do have got better and they will continue to get better but we need to keep doing the work and not get complacent because absolutely there are still so many problems facing women and people of different communities. Increasingly the world is at war. How can storytelling um, lessen the hurt and the harm? 
I don't know if it's storytelling's role to lessen it. I think it's storytelling's role to face it head on and offer a different narrative. Okay. Because I do think escapism is important, of course I do, as a children's writer, and I want to protect children, but I think there is a responsibility to also reflect the world as it is and give people new stories, new ways of seeing the world as a hopeful and beautiful place in order to motivate them to try and change things. And I think the most important things books can do is provide us with empathy. They can grow our empathy and they can make us kinder, bigger hearted. And it's not a weak thing to wish for peace. And I wish that that was more of a narrative that um, you know, war is in fact the coward's way out because it's easy. It's easy to say black, white, fight. It's not easy to find a middle way. And so I think if we can use stories to make things more complicated, not more simple, then I think we'll find a way forward. How important is it uh, for us as adults to view ourselves as magical beings? I believe every human being is magical. I believe the way that we are the product of people who across millennia have loved each other and sort of gone on and created their own families and created their own stories. We all carry so much history within us mm -hmm. that to stand in this moment or sit in this moment with you is an extraordinary it's an extraordinary set of circumstances that came to us being in this beautiful place, in this beautiful courtyard on such a peaceful evening. And I think if we spent more time looking at the sunset, and I mean actually looking mm -hmm. and actually absorbing what it means to stand in that light, I think that we would all be better off. And, and I can hear my own father laughing at me saying this because he'd say, oh, that's so soft. But my father loves poetry, and what greater poetry is there than a sunset? So I think that, yeah, if adults can really not reach back only to their inner child, but actually to who they are now and the miracle of just being, then we'd all be a lot more open-hearted and a lot better off. Beautiful stuff. Thank you very much. Uh, Kiran Milwood Hargrave, thank you. Enjoy the rest of your um, visit in Sri Lanka, and I hope to see you again. Thank you. Same.